Welcome to Coaching Uncaged by Animas, the podcast that explores the art, science and career of coaching. And now introducing your host and interviewer, Yannick Jacob. All right, David Drake, welcome to the podcast. Hello, welcome. <laughs> it's really good to have you and to have you back because mm. you were here three years ago uh, talking to Rob, Robert Stevenson, and uh, I've just re-listened to the episode as well uh, to kind of refresh it, not not be repetitive too much, mm -hmm. and uh, just still feeding off the excitement. So if anybody's uh, listening or watching this, uh, it's a really good uh, place to go perhaps even first, you know, uh, mm. just pause this, uh, cue this, uh, because there's so much already uh, around the foundations of, of narrative theory, narrative practice. You've been uh, for decades uh, a name, an influential name in the field. Uh, you've been called the, the founder of narrative coaching. Uh, you are, um, you're extending a tradition of narrative work, which mm -hmm. I, I personally really appreciate because if I think stories are the foundation of learning. I mean, for ever since humans existed and could mm. communicate, we've communicated through stories. And then there's so much story that isn't verbal necessarily. necessarily. Mm. So there's a lot there. So you've you've uh, been active in that space. You've been working with every organization on the planet, it seems. Uh, you've gone beyond coaching to see mm. what narrative practice can offer uh, to systemic issues as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, you've written books, you've written a ton of articles. Um, I think there's just such a rich body of work that you've contributed. So first of all, thank you. And I wonder mm -hmm. if there's anything that might be helpful for coaches out there to know about you, uh, just of where you're speaking from. Um, <clears throat> I think all my life I've been a curious person. Um, and sometimes that means I'm a bit restless because I just love, um, inquiring into things i've always been when i was younger i was shyer um and so one of the gifts of that was i got really good at noticing things huh. and i think <laughs> blessing and the curse eh? <laughs> yeah it is and it was a, a, as a child sometimes it felt like a curse but now later in life i'm just really grateful um i think i was born this way in a way but you know it's what i a lot of times when i would do demonstrations coaches would be sort of perplexed like how could i no notice know that or f feel that or why how did i notice say that and i said well i don't it's not magic it's just i notice things that most of you miss um because you're so eager to coach it's yeah. amazing to yeah. me how yeah. off how quickly something can be labeled magic just because they're yeah. there is a an element or a, an aspect that some people just don't perceive no. And so a lot of our work is really just helping people see more. Hmm. And um, and once they can see more about themselves, about the field in front of them, about the other human, then they become much more discerning in their use of their skills. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. We could at this point already dig into the practicalities, <laughs> but I want to take a few steps back. And actually, that's a question I wanted to ask you to start yes. off. Do you have a favorite story? Um, I mean, like uh, from literature or? Uh, could be any if that just pops up, but could also be one. When I was thinking about it, I guess I was thinking about maybe something that illustrates narrative practice in some way. Hmm. Um, well, I think early in... Um, Early in my, even before narrative coaching, um, I I was just really struck by um, the power of trusting that there was a an origin to our stories that we often can't see. <clears throat> and actually, one of the primary reasons why we even have narrative coaching was, uh, it's actually in my book, but... Um, I was in a fascinating workshop on group dreaming and um, <clears throat> and the facilitator uh, was responding to uh, someone's question. I know how sometimes some they say somebody says something that isn't really relevant exactly to what you're thinking, but is adjacent enough to like gives you that missing piece. Hmm. 
And so what I started to realize almost immediately when I was listening to her was that the stories we tell in the daytime serve the same function as the dreams we have at night. It's just our psyche trying to work something out. Mm -hmm. And so I started to really um, focus on helping people's stories come alive in the room and that I was less interested in coaching and far more interested in their stories because the stories both re tended to reveal the opening for change, but also the pathway to find it. Um, and so that everything that we needed was already there in the story and in the moment. Um, <clears throat> and um, and our job really is to figure out what would enable the people to that are involved, whether it's a coaching client, a friend, to be able to access their own story. And I'll give you a really simple, powerful example recently. So my father passed away 24 years ago. Um, and my mother and my younger brother were both present when he passed away, but they've always struggled to talk about that for a number of reasons. And I've tried all kinds of ways using all my skills to get them to share more. And they did some, but you know, because I was not only grieving that loss, but grieving that I could not be there for that. And mm. I, have, I have a lot of training in this back. I was a grief counselor. I was a hospital chaplain. So I know a lot about those things. And um, just through a variety of circumstances I don't need to go into, I was visiting my mom. My younger brother happened to be there. And I realized that I had been asking them all those years about their experience in that moment, which was you know, it's hard to talk about and isn't always very comfortable for them. And so out of the blue, I just had this feeling like, oh, I'm asking these not just for them, but for my dad. So what if I just ask them about my dad? And so I I shared with, I just said out loud, do you think dad was aware that he was dying? Hmm. And they both just completely transformed um, how they were present in the room because they didn't have to talk about themselves. Yeah. And I've, I, I had never seen them in that space before. Um, my mother gave an immediate and incredibly poignant response, which was, yes, he was. Um, and she, he was able to signal sort of goodbye to her. Even my younger brother, who doesn't always, you know, go well in these some of these spaces, even he talked about um, his perception of dad's experience. And, and I just realized that that information was there the whole time, hmm. but they didn't, I don't know, they, they never went there and I never asked there. And so what it means for me in my work and what makes this a great story for me is that we get so caught up in our agonizing about, am I coaching well, or am I asking the right question? And it doesn't, those things don't really matter in a way because whatever is wanting to happen is already present. Mm. And our job is to discern what would help unlock this present moment so we could find language or understanding or compassion or whatever we're asked to, to do. So yeah, so that was a very, it, it was, was palpable, the difference that was created just by changing the orientation of my question. Uh, so really finding an access to the story where yeah. before there was a block now all of a yeah. sudden there was so much and yeah that's the same story and we can't exactly. tell a story without involving ourselves yeah and and the, and the, and the, it didn't un unlock this flood of story from them because they're both not quite that way but what they said was so powerful and so succinct because somehow it got right to the root of what i really wanted and what they I think had secretly longed to be able to share themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was almost like they were surprising themselves, hearing themselves say this out loud for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. So in the, in the light of that, I am not going to ask you to tell me about how you got into storytelling or the okay. exploring the power of story, but I'd, I'd love to get curious about the history of storytelling or how mm. come stories are so valuable and so powerful and how this approach has developed out of it. Yeah. So, I, you know, it's, um, as far as we know, we're the only creatures that form stories. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's been a hallmark of the human experience 
if you go to the cave paintings in France and other places in the world that are, you know, I've spent a fair bit of time working with Aboriginal leaders and communities in Australia. And so I've got 50,000 years of stories. Mm. It's the way that people historically make sense and meaning. They try to uh, con communicate legacy. They try to, um, you know, I know you have a long background in existentialism. And so I think there's some way that stories give us a sense of of uh, beingness and presence in, in not only in ourself, like this is my story, but also in context. So I'm part of these stories. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, there's no one that can't tell a story. It's what clients do all the time. And so I just found for me, I, I consider myself sort of an enlightened pragmatist on my good days. Uh, <laughs> I, I pursue enlightenment not for its own sake, but because it's just way more pr pragmatic. Mm. And for me, I um, I don't believe in like collecting long lists of coaching questions. I don't even need to understand what's going to happen five minutes from now in a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, <clears throat> so for me, the stories are so great because it's what humans instinctively do. Uh, when they to give an example, to try to explain themselves, to explore something, it's their way of kind of building a bridge between their world, often inside themselves and yours. Mm -hmm. And and then and so I thought, why agonize over trying to construct a coaching conversation, which ends up being more about me than about them, and just take their story at face value, and um. The, the second thing about that is that, you know, if you've, so now in my mid sixties, there's stories about my early life that I probably have explored dozens of times over my life. And every time I explore them, I see them differently. Mm -hmm. Same experience, different story. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons why I found uh, stories so helpful, particularly if you're working with a client over time, is you're kind of wondering like, of all the stories they could have told, why did the, why did this one come out? And why is it coming out in this format now? And why does it seem to be emphasizing this now? And what I realized was that there's, you know, I'm a long longstanding Jungian scholar, and um, is that their psyche or their sort of inner being is trying to surface something, like going back to the piece about dreams, trying to surface something unconsciously that it would like us to pay attention to for the growth or healing of the person. Mm -hmm. And so by listening to their story construction, we get a much better idea of where are they now on their developmental journey? Where are they um, now on their maturation around this particular story? And this is really helpful because I'm only really interested in what they're ready for right now. The rest is moot. Mm -hmm. I think oftentimes as coaches, we get too far ahead of our clients. And then we wonder why they don't deliver on what they said they were going to do. Mm -hmm. Because just because they had a invigorating conversation with you doesn't mean they're actually ready to do anything about any of that. And so the story gives us really a clear sense of their orientation to themselves and the story and the characters and how they feel about that and what they think about that and what they're, you know, in your world, existentially ready to actually face. Mm -hmm. And that gives us a much better marker for how do we want to show up to them. Yeah, so yeah. much is revealed uh, through mm -hmm. how someone tells a story. Mm -hmm. Or I'd say if they tell a story, just because I had a recent experience where as part of a consultation, as I often do, I say, well, would you, would you tell me your story? <laughs> you know, I'm yeah. just a, as a way to get to know them. And uh, I had this client who just started giving me a bullet point list of mm -hmm. descriptors of their life. Yeah. You know, when uh, I had kind of, imagine that tell me the story you know maybe yeah. not quite once upon a time but the question in there uh, i guess kind of go to the to the basics is well what what is a story uh, yeah. because people might listen to this and think well the story means once upon a time and there's a protagonist and interacting yeah. with other characters uh, but I, I think this is a lot more than that so could you give yeah. us a framework for what storytelling actually means yeah, and so many of us in the West assume that stories have beginnings, middles, and ends, but in, in a lot of cultures, that's not the case. Um, but I, I actually don't ask clients to tell me stories anymore because then they get all caught up and, oh, I've got to think of one, and, oh, that's not very good, and mm -hmm. they, they are, they've already self-centered themselves. 
So the person giving you a bullet list, a dot point list, is telling you a story. Yeah. They're telling you a lot of things about themselves. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, but it's not framed as a story. So <laughs> I just, um, I just leave out the word story altogether, unless the client happens to bring it up. And even then, I just find it gets in our way. So I would ask things more like, "Can you tell me about the last time that happened?" Or if you look ahead, what are you hoping will happen? What does that sound like? Or, um, you know, um, I'm trying to understand you're you're expressing your animosity towards your boss can you tell me kind of when that arose or how did you come to notice that about yourself and then they will tell me a story in some fashion but i don't have to go through the door it marked story i just find it gives them freedom and permission to answer the question in a way that serves them mm -hmm. and if they if they um if there's things in their explanation or they're sharing that intrigued me, I might get them to round it out mm -hmm. to a whole story. Like I noticed, like when you were, I uh, might say to a client, which I often do, um, I'm noticing that you've made this story a lot about your team member who you have, or you're, you feel in conflict with. I'm wondering wh what this is like for you. And do you send, have a sense in how you've contributed to this? Well, no, no, I mean, it can't be. And, well, mm -hmm. so there's a whole giant gap in the story because they're not actually in it. Mm -hmm. And so that says, so then the story framing for me becomes very helpful because um, while there's no one universal format for a story, we there's some common components. And so I'm kind of mentally and subconsciously scanning which ones are they emphasizing, which ones are they um, not emphasizing, where might we want to pay some attention. And so, and, and, and with that, um, I find that um, for many of our clients, um, it's difficult for them to talk directly about their own experience. So it shows up indirectly in their stories. Mm -hmm. So we often take the position of um, objects or characters or positions even in the story um, as a way for them to find themselves uh, in the story. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you had commented on that in, in your conversation with Rob, and I think it's worth reiterating that it's not that at, at this level of practicing narrative coaching, it's not that you're inviting someone into your process by no. asking them to tell you a story. Everything that you need is right in front of you. Exactly. We cannot help but tell stories, uh, even if it doesn't sound like a story right. that we would recognize as such. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I'd, I'd love to go back, even though uh, I, I would like to stay present with that, but uh, mm. I wonder where we need to go to learn more about, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants very mm -hmm. often. And yeah. uh, I, I think there's a number of giants out there that have brought about a way of utilizing story. I mean, stories mm. have always been utilized, but there's a more systematic way now of doing it. Um, could you tell us a bit more about how that's developed? Um, so I, um, I've, uh, across all my degrees, I've always been fascinated by more of a sociological perspective than just purely a psychological one. And so from in the story realm, how that shows up. And so there'd be classic people like, um, Joseph Campbell and others who are looking at mythologies, um, I have found a lot of value in studying uh, Jung and others on alchemy um, and things that are helping us realize that stories are way more than words and way more than this present moment. And even though in narrative coaching, we bring the past, present, and future into the present, um, there's always their particular stories is, are always embedded in a larger set of social narratives. Mm -hmm. And I feel like now, like, for example, you know, in a lot of this time where it feels like there's um, increased polarization and challenge and uh, distrust, and, and um, there's a lot of host reasons for that. But uh, if you look at these things alchemically or systematically, you start to realize there's major mythological energies moving through the world right now that we forget are larger than life. And we we then, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, we sort of um, we attach them to individuals or positions. Um, and so I feel like, um, you know, a lot of people that have taken a much more maybe regressive or 
uh, authoritarian desires for how we should live together. Uh, it's not what I would choose, and I don't think it's very healthy for us. And if I look, step back at it from a mythological perspective, there's a human need for safety with being amongst people like yourself. There's an ease that comes for many of us that when, and you talked about, you know, your difference between living in London versus living in Berlin, right? You, it sounds like you feel a bit more at ease in Berlin because of the way you experience the city. It doesn't make them better or worse than each other. They're just different. Yeah. And so I think one of the things that we have a responsibility to do as coaches, and I, I feel like, you know, I know you all have done work on neurodiversity. There's all the diversity and inclusion work. Uh, which I think is all fantastic. And we being able to see and hear people's stories in the context of larger mythologies, mm -hmm. because that's the that's what's really driving a lot of this is not their their their, mal, their malfunction or their um their particular uh, grievances or whatever. It's like there's 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 larger energies moving through the world that we don't know what to do with. And a lot of the forms with which we used to have those conversations are not available to us or they're they're under uh, duress or a lot of things. And so I think for me, like if we get too focused only on the individual story, not only do we not help them fully because it's not we don't pay attention to their context, but we're not actually addressing the larger issues which are creating a lot of the duress our clients are bringing to sessions. And so I know this is going way beyond what you were think, perhaps thinking of, but part of like going backwards where I, I want to help us go forward. And yeah, I think yeah. part of the forward of coaching is we've got to take a more sociological perspective. Yeah. Um, otherwise, we're just putting on endless band-aids yeah. and then wondering why our clients keep coming back with paper cuts. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that kind of goes into the next question I wanted to ask yeah. as well, because stories are so much, stories influence us well mm -hmm. beyond our individual stories and how we tell them. There's yeah. mythological stories, there's stories from generations ago mm -hmm. that are still with us, because even if our grandparents or parents haven't told us those particular stories, they're being lived by generations yeah. of people or they've been influencing people that we interact with all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really important kind of systemic lens on individual practice. Um, we'd never quite only work with an individual in isolation in front of us. No. Yeah. And, you know, another example of somebody that I've, I've, I've studied of a lot of people like, um, um, Lev Vygotsky and Paulo Freire and John Dewey, you know, um, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm blanking his name now. Um, okay, it'll come back to me. But um, <clears throat> the um, who wrote Varieties of Religious Experience? William James. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what a name to blank on. <laughs> yeah, I know. But all these people, especially for like people like John Dewey and, and William James, you know, wrote over 100 years ago, even some of Freud's early writings, um, you know, who, who, in many ways for me are more informative than most of the books we have now because they they were working at the fundamental building blocks of what it means to be human and humans together um and a lot of these people were really fascinated by how do we appreciate the context within which we're working but to be able to elevate the individual in terms of the journey they need to be on mm -hmm. and and to move away from sort of the mass production of education, the mass production of coaching, and to recognize that we can't just go all in on the individual because then we lose the context, but to be able to elevate them. And what is what are the narratives in which they're operating right now? How is that serving them, not serving them? How are they relating to those stories? Mm. How might it need to change some of those relationships to kind of move to a different place? And I feel like we live in this time in which... Um, you, you almost are forced, no, it doesn't, it's not quite this dramatic, but it's often you feel like there maybe is a choice between adopting rigid stories that you know maybe don't even really exist anymore, but feel comforting, to then over here, and this is where the existentialists, I think there's a new generation of that work coming. Because then you're faced with the open abyss, right? Mm -hmm. Which is overwhelming for most people. Mm -hmm. Um 
And I feel like we're into this maybe exploration uh, of a third way. We can't stay addicted or attached to um, stories of endless growth or hom homogeneity or many of the things or en endless progress or those kind of things that many of us in this very unique historical window of post Second World War Western Western nations, um, in particular. Mm. But nor can we just sort of like, what what do I do? Where do I go? And what what does all this mean? It, it, that's not helpful either. Um, and so I feel like stories are so important because the stories and like for me in my generation, the stories that I was raised on don't exist anymore in a way because that world doesn't exist at all and, and will never come back. Mm -hmm. It was an anomaly in human history. And, and so things like reverse coaching and mentoring, like how do we help the younger people teach us about what they're seeing in the world that we're not seeing? And and um, how do we find sort of new narrative patterns that will allow us to find a better way forward as a species? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 there's so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, don't, I don't tend to think very small. So, yeah. No, no, this is great. And and I'm aligned with it. And I think it's important, but I also have our audience in mind. So um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think what's important for us is to recognize that we shape our stories mm. and um, that we create meaning in our stories, that there isn't one story mm -hmm. um, and that we have a lot more autonomy to reauthor our stories. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, narrative therapy uh, where has been opening up a lot for me. I remember doing a mm -hmm. mediation training once that was based on a concept from Michael White, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the person isn't a problem. The problem is the problem and we have a lot of power to retell our story and adjust it to the world that we're living now mm -hmm. we're being drawn to simple stories because we want the world to make sense mm -hmm. and it's really difficult if we look at the complexity of being human um, yeah. and but at the same time there's comfort and people are drawn to comfort there's comfort mm -hmm. in a simple story i understand why people hold on to that yes i, I do too you once said uh, that every coaching, all coaching is therapeutic to some extent, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I was wondering about what makes coaching different to therapy when we work narratively and to what extent are we able to reauthor our story? Because some, some aspects of being human or being ourselves, they're, they're quite sedimented, uh, you know, and others yeah. can be really loosened up. And I, I, you know, in the context of what is it coaching? Is it therapy? Does it even matter? Um, how far can we change ourselves through reauthoring our story? Yeah. Well, uh, so I, I hear two big questions in there about one is the distinction between therapy and coaching, and one is the degree to which change is possible. Um, so the, I'll answer the first one because it's a simpler question to me. Um, it was the very first question I ever received when I presented on narrative coaching in a Sydney 20 years ago. Um, and somebody said, well, this sounds like therapy. And I said, and your point is one. <laughs> and I, and I, and I said, you know, any, pretty much anything we achieve that's new for us through coaching will have to pass through some portal of healing. There's something about our old story, our old identity, our old habits that kept us from achieving whatever it is we were trying to achieve through coaching. And there's often some grief, some forgiveness, some a lot of things we would equate more with a therapeutic stance. Otherwise, it's just transactional. And that's, for me, not really the best use of coaching. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so like, like I said, we're dealing with humans. So fundamentally, there's a healing component to some degrees more than others. So what I would always tell coaches is my highest value is integrity. Mm. So are you in integrity with yourself? It means you're operating in a way that you feel confident and skilled to do so. So if you don't have any background in grief, you avoid grief yourself, then don't talk to a client about grief because you may, you may likely not do very well. At the same time, many of us, especially now, are coming to coaching with so much more resourcing degrees life experiences previous careers 
uh, personal work we've done ourselves. And for me, it doesn't make any sense to withhold that from a client. And so again, I go back to integrity. So I'm in integrity with myself. So I'm doing the things I feel authentically qualified to do. I'm in integrity with my agreement with this client. So I don't make my client go anywhere. I don't do anything that they don't want. I don't impose my, oh, you should do some grief work here if that's not what they want. Um, so, but I'm in integrity with my agreement with my clients. And so I will say to them up front, I will give you everything that I have in service of what you need. Uh, so, hmm. And so if I have things that are not under the traditional banner of coaching, I'm not interested that it, I, I shouldn't do that. Why? I'm only beholden to my client and my own integrity. And then if there's sponsors or funders for the coaching, then that's another sort of set, set of stakeholders. But um, for me, and like, you know, and I have, I've taught uh, a lot of therapists how to use narrative coaching skills to operationalize a lot of the uh, more, more um, uh, psychological work they're doing with their clients. And they found that really practical and very helpful. But then there's so, narrative skills, right? Rather than yes, narrative exactly. coaching skills. Co coaching is just, I mean, I even called it narrative coaching for two reasons. One, narrative therapy was already taken and I wasn't that interested <laughs> in being a therapist. Uh, I had great admiration for Michael's work. Um, and two, it was the closest, this was 25 years ago when coaching was really pretty new. Um, coaching seemed the closest outlet for describing what I wanted to do that I could get paid for. Mm -hmm. And I've given a lot to coaching over this 25 years, but I'm not, it's just a word. And again, it's a word that I want to have integrity around so that when I, my client buys me as a coach, they know what to expect. So I don't start doing plumbing with them or, you know, <laughs> something else. But I, I feel like um, coaches in some ways have been made to be afraid of therapy or um, I think there was a lot of um, sort of sibling rivalry when coaching came along. It wanted to prove it was as good as, as if not better than psychotherapy. And in some ways it is better than psychotherapy. And in some ways it's really not. Um, but I, I feel like we, we are a human walking alongside a human who's trying to move, get somewhere, resolve something, discover something. And again, as long as we're in integrity with ourself and our understanding of our agreements with our client, then I'm willing to bring whatever feels like it's in service of the client and their well-being. I think, and I think the other thing that, um, and there's a lot I could say here, but the other thing, it's one, one of the many reasons why we don't tend to set goals in narrative coaching. And my observation is that the person who sets a goal is not the person who's going to achieve it. Otherwise, they already would have achieved it. In the process of moving towards achieving something, they will become somebody else who's capable of doing that. So I'm not interested in setting an agenda at the start of the conversation because most clients don't really know why they're there. I'm not interested in setting goals because we hardly ever end up where we started. Um, but as part of that, I, I, I want to take a person on a journey of new experiences, some experimentation and exploration so that by the time they get to a place like, oh, that's what I really wanted all along. They're they're actually they've moved themselves to a place where they believe they can now go do that. If we don't do that, if we chase the goal, even if they get to the place where they achieve the goal, but they're still the same person, it's not going to work for them because they're not going to have the skills or maturity or whatever they need to really fundamentally fulfill that goal. Um, and so again, we can start to trace the arc of their story. Um, which is why the narrative coaching model is built the way it is, to, so that they evolve themselves so the new behavior becomes a logical extension who, of who they became. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pick you up on that. I think the concern around coaches doing what we might frame therapeutic work uh, is that it requires a sense for integrity. And I mm. think um, I'm certainly concerned at some coaches who uh, are not particularly self-aware, uh, mm. maybe a bit overconfident uh, yeah. and working with people who are in deep pain and yeah. you know they don't want to work with a therapist, but they would really need one. And when mm -hmm. I say therapist, I, I would say somebody who's 
experienced a lot and reflected a lot and yes. now done years and years of work on themselves before they get to a point where they're allowed to call themselves a therapist in most countries. Yes. Um, and that's that's where I would be concerned because I see coaching expanded a lot in the last decade or so. Um, and there are some approaches such as narrative, for example, that that do work in the gray and it's not mm -hmm. so important anymore, but it's also easy to say when you do have all of this experience, um, yes. you know, there's a lot of new coaches leaving a corporate career doing six months of training, if that, uh, <laughs> a, and then I see them take on people with really, really painful stories full of suffering and I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. I am too. And again, it goes back to integrity. Then I would say they're out of integrity with themselves and they're out of their integrity of their promise of coaching. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. And I, I think that's just um, something, I mean, for me, I've been working on this project with the Institute of Coaching on the five maturities. And one of the, one of the propositions is that we over uh, focus on this illusion of mastery in coaching. Mm. Uh, more courses, more books, more certificates. Uh, but I'll take a mature non-coach over an immature coach any day. Mm. And so for me, I feel like, especially in the world that we live in now, and some of those stories like you just described of the the pain for a lot of our clients and the world that we're in, maturity matters way more than um, how many certificates you have. Um mm. Because many of which don't are great for skills and uh, knowledge, but yeah. don't really prepare you as, as a human to sit across somebody who's hurting. Oh, yeah. And there's so yeah. many people who come into coach training and they don't consider themselves coaches, but the mature beings with a, you know, yes. decades of experience in relationships and listening and mm -hmm. relating to each other and, you know... <laughs> And I'm like, yeah. well, you've already hold beautiful space. Like, yeah. why do you tell yourself this story that you're not a coach and that you need all of these certifications? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong. I think it's good to get certified and get trained, but mm -hmm. there's, there's, you know, in the light of I'll take a mature non-coach <laughs> over <laughs> a non-mature coach any yeah. day. Um, yeah. I'd really want to offer that to people out there whose inner critic uh, might yeah. be very, very strong. Yeah. Um, and I think particularly there's, um, and it's always a fine line, but, you know, pain and hardship come in many flavors. Mm -hmm. And so we have a predisposition to some often based on our own autobiography. And, um, <clears throat> and you know, so I, I went to f four schools by the time I was seven, all, always on my own. And, um, and it's, it's made me a very resilient person and with a lot of grit. I wouldn't want for it. I didn't want, I wouldn't want that for others in a way when it compared to other hardships, it's actually nothing, but, um, but it's given me this great sensitivity to people that struggle to belong or fit in. Um, and so I, I think, I mean, for me, um, there are certainly a lot of pragmatics that go into coaching, but it, coaching is just a word. <laughs> um, a, the, a lot of what makes us a great coach is our own willingness, to, like you said, to do our own work, to resolve our own as many of our own issues, and to circle back to something we never we didn't touch on. Um, you asked, you know, can we change our stories? And probably, if we lived a thousand years, maybe. But then, um, I think one of the pieces of wisdom I've uh, been moving towards is there's some stories you just need to compost and let go of. That there's not enough time in life. Um, some maybe there's people involved that are no longer with us, which you can still do things with. But um, for example, I think there's this obsession that we have to perfect ourselves. We have to solve it all. We have to get whole and better and complete. And uh, even some of the cliches in coaching, you know, we're we're not complete. We will die broken people in some ways, and that's fine. It's just parts of what makes us human. Um, and I think it's like, in terms of what for ourselves or our clients is important to you right now, what things would help you move towards that, that that's where I would, for myself and for my clients, I direct energy, not to things that, you know, would take three lifetimes and may often not even be ours, their inherited trauma. And, um, and so I think it's, there's, a a level of compassion and forgiveness and 
just letting certain things be and fall back to earth and be absorbed and not try to solve it all. Otherwise, we spend our whole life trying to solve all that and, and we st we don't live. Yeah. Can you give yeah. us an example of a of a story that maybe one of your clients brought or maybe a story that you've just had to let go? Um, so I think about, um, you know, from different uh, bodies of work and perspective, there's a sort of a view that a lot of our um, things that we're trying to address in our own life are actually on behalf of people who came before us, mm -hmm. culturally or familially or, or relationally or whatever. Um, and so, you know, I think about, you know, we're always in this ongoing narrative exploration about our relationship to our parents, mm -hmm. for good or bad. And again, it, it's going back to what I said before, you know, you can think about certain anecdotes from your childhood or whatever a hundred times and have a hundred different stories about them. And same anecdote or same experience, but perceived differently. Fluid. And I think there's there's a piece where, and this is where, without diverging too far, um, the Tibetan book of living and dying is so important here because it talks a lot about this notion of bardo or stages of release as people die. And I sort of equate that to in life about stages of releasing people or releasing stories, even when they don't feel complete or done. Um, and so like for, for me and my own family of origin and some other sort of things I experienced as traumatizing early in my life, there's enough to resolve so they no longer adversely infect me most of the time. Will they ever be fully resolved? No but it's enough. I don't need to devote more energy to them. Mm -hmm. And again, I feel like for so many of our clients, just giving them a path to peace and say, that's enough. Is that enough for you to move forward now? Mm -hmm. Will that help you enough to get what you need next in your career or your life? And you might come back to visit this five years from now. You might not. Um, but this sort of endless striving to fix it all or perfect it all, study it all i think it just drives us mad <laughs> and i th and i think it's one of the gifts of getting older and especially having been sick uh quite a bit over these last 12 months um it's just given me an appreciation for the limitations of our energy the limitations of possibility in a way i found quite uh constricting at first but just like with a child you know one of the things that children because they can't self-soothe um, in, a, in the attachment work, we talk a lot about creating uh, st structure for them. And you, you would know this with your young one, just sometimes holding them or letting them lean against you is all they need to self-regulate because they can't do that yet themselves. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that, and it's why I always have uh, studied attachment work, our needs of our client are actually simpler than we often appreciate. We want to go into all these convoluted stories and analytics and psychologies they may just want somebody to lean against and breathe. Not, yeah. Maybe not literally, but figuratively. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> maybe literally in some cases, I don't know. But um, to be able to find themselves again, to say, oh, that's enough, or that's okay. Um, I can move on now. I can let go. And so uh, just like with our coaches, we're doing the same for our clients. We're trying to lighten their load, mm -hmm. get them to put some things down. It's all right. Let it go. Mm -hmm. um, and then when they're ready to take something up, then then we go and we meet them there. Yeah. So then what happens when you meet a client, work with them, you hear their story and you realize that one of their stories that seems to be really in the way, it's really unhelpful to maintain this story, is no longer useful mm -hmm. and it's blatantly obvious. And I think most coaches will recognize uh, such moments. But mm -hmm. the story seems to be so... So, uh, well, sediment, as I said it before, right? It's so set. It seems to be difficult to open up or change or reauthor because it's been repeated too many yeah. times. Uh, how do you how do you open that up? How do you invite someone who seems to be really stuck in their story? Um, so part of my um, commitment to integrity is I'm not interested in changing my clients. Mm -hmm. Um, so part of, I take a very, um, sort of, uh, it is where I really align with sort of Fritz Perls's work on this, where 
the fastest way to help people change is to stop trying to change them. Mm -hmm. And so we we just help. So part of it might just be mirroring back to them. I, I'm hearing this story, and it sounds like these other stories you've shared before. Are you aware of that pattern? Again, that will tell you a lot about their awareness of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I, I might just get them to, um, in, in our work, um, we, um, we focus a lot on um, <clears throat> how, what would you have to be able to let go of in order to let be what is true for you? Mm -hmm. So part of that is, um, oh, I've been told all my life I should fix this, or I know my team doesn't like this about me, but I don't know how to do anything. I don't know how to make that different. It's been my... A bit, it's been that way my whole life. Yeah, let, let's assume that person has that kind of awareness. For example, yeah. um, can think of a recent client who's been growing up with terrible bullying and yeah. not particularly aware parents about, you know, a, a story of mm -hmm. like, you, you're not good enough and you're not going to yeah. be. And so a very, very profound, very loud inner critic yeah. Um and they know they know where it's come from they they know what yeah. it was they know what they would need to let go of and intellectually that all makes sense but emotionally it's all yeah. just so loud and so difficult mm -hmm. that it's they, they're unable to seem to be unable to let go of that yeah so um again this might be beyond the remit for most coaches most coaches would not know what to do with that and shouldn't try in some ways but mm -hmm. um you know, I, I've i always been, a for decades, have been a fan of various iterations of what we now think of as parts work. I don't like labels of calling the parts things. I don't find that very useful but uh, or accurate. But um, this notion of um, helping people accept you're fine just the way you are. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to be done about this right now in this moment in time. It feels might feel painful. It brings back bad memories. You you can even see some of the consequences on yourself and others, and that's okay. For right now, we're just going to be with that. And and in there, often is a you know if, again, if you feel qualified and capable of going here, there's a, a capacity to help them appreciate what has that enabled you to do in your life, right? Mm -hmm. And well, maybe it's made you more sensitive to bullying in your workplace, or maybe that's helped you become very resilient and very driven. Um, great. It also has consequences you don't like, but wow, look at what it's done for you. And so a lot of it's um, allowing people to use the space you're in working with them to sort of breathe and let go of some of the, uh, the need to have to do that to survive, mm -hmm. um, to see what might come into that space, no matter how small you've just opened up. Hmm. Um, yeah. For most people. Hmm? Uh, sorry, I, I was just like, just by that inquiry, just by bringing in the curiosity yeah. of how yeah. has this been serving you, this seemingly super unhelpful, destructive behavior, um, yeah. it just invites a client to already tell themselves a different story. Because it's often yes. a question they've never asked themselves. Why would I look for value in something that's clearly bad yeah. um, and not serving me? Uh, and I think uh, it opens up it opens up an opportunity to tell a story differently. And I think, mm -hmm. in my experience, that's almost always there that opportunity yeah. to uh, reposition ourselves within that yeah. story. And I think opening that parts work, whether that's internal family systems or any other kind of multiplicity uh, yeah. framework, I think find it super helpful. Because there's just different just... stories that can be alive at the same time, yeah, and they're in conflict. They're... Because each of these parts are is a is part of our own identity and has its own set of stories and needs and um, and so we like to um, in our work, particularly when I used to be able to travel more before the pandemic and stuff, where I would do a lot of retreats. So we would be able to invite people into experiences they wouldn't have allowed themselves to have. Mm -hmm. And so, like for your client, there I might if I were working with them, probably more personally than in a retreat, but I might get them to stand on top of a table and yell. Hmm. Why? So they can find the bully in themselves. 
and they can activate the part of themselves they that wasn't able to and probably wasn't safe to express before. Mm. Um, I might put two chairs in front of them and say, "Those that's your parents. What did you want to say to them all those years? And so again, this is clearly therapeutic. So, and I have, again, because I've done this for 25 years, I feel confident. I, I If you had asked me this 25 years ago, I would have said, no, I would never do that because I wasn't confident. I didn't have that skill mm -hmm. or that maturity. Um, and we're basically just trying to loosen what somebody called what's the narrative grip. The story is like this, and it's always going to be like this. Well, why don't you mm -hmm. just like move this finger, you know, and then put it back uh... and moved it again and then put it back. Well, then maybe you move this one, you know, maybe. Mm -hmm. you, um, and so you're just trying to kind of get a little bit of loosen the death grip of these configurations to open up through experiment. Like I said, experimentation, experiencing, um, narrating, embodying, moving um, um, the possibility that they could form they mean they can never fully resolve all that and that's okay that's just the scars of living but they can put it behind them enough so they have more choices mm -hmm. yeah 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 um this i'm just putting myself into the mind of the audience right and this i think i reckon this can sound very complex uh if this is new to people and i heard you talk about how it's important to keep things simple um and to really get to the to the crooks of the matter could yeah. you could you tell us a little bit more about how we can find the simplicity in the complexity yeah um um it's all for me it's only complex if you um see the world in a very mechanistic way um the the way that we talk about it in narrative coaching is that we um <clears throat> we uh, whether we're talking about the past present or future we're only dealing in the present moment in the present space so in the field the energetic space between us um and we're noticing what's chosen to show up in the field um and so for me um i um I recognize that there's many layers to the stories our clients bring, but I'm only really interested in what is the one they want to pay attention to now and are capable of doing so with some support from me. Um, and so we, um, oftentimes it's uh, one of the most powerful ways we do that is let, inviting them to say certain things out loud they've never heard themselves say before. And then notice how that feels in their body. And then notice what ripples from that. How might that influence or inform how you might go forward differently in this particular scenario? What part of yourself have, is dormant or never got activated or doesn't show up now that might be helpful to you? How can we start creating some experiments around that? Um, and, um, and so we want people to start living into this, not talking about it. And so the crux of the issue is not like there's a singular golden door that we have to hunt for and find. It's the door that's open. That's the often that that has some mm. import and some resonance for the person. And so I don't know why, but this somehow feels important to them. Mm -hmm. And so the crux, again, it's not a singular place or a singular idea. It's um, it's a singular opening that feels significant. And that's where we enter in, and we don't know because we're both with the client and ourselves, we're entering to the unknown. They've never been here before. We certainly have never been here before with them. And so we're like, okay, so now we're in this dark room. Now, what are we going to do? Well, let's let, let our eyes be quiet and, and um, soften. And what are we starting to notice? Oh, there's some sadness over here. Oh, or I'm attracted over there, or I'm getting this idea. And wait, let's go. And then we start to feel it's, and, and all we're doing is, uh, walking alongside their soul, their psyche, their spirit, whatever words you want to use, as it's trying to get us to see something. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that this is, uh, when we work this way, which is more what we use, uh, the term we use is structured emergence. It's not pure emergence. That's like trying to coach in a tsunami. It's not pure structure. That doesn't get you anywhere. It's noticing what's emerging and creating enough in a, in a Vygotskyan kind of way 
um, enough structure around it, enough scaffolding for them to feel safe to say, what is this? How, why is this in my story? Well, I don't know. Let's look at that. And um, and then there's often the surprise, like, ooh, that's why this is in my story. Um, and so, so it's it's simple in the sense of we've. I just tell my coaches, put everything you know about coaching in your back pocket, hmm. and leave it there until something of it is needed, which isn't nearly as often as you think. <laughs> you don't need to talk as much as you think you need to talk. Um, and what you're doing is noticing where are there openings in the story where something might happen. And that's where we're going to put our energy. And so it's simple because um, I'm not trying to keep track of everything in a conversation. I'm noticing in this moment, and one of our expressions is this moment is your curriculum. Hmm. What, what, what is this moment making available to the client and to us that we should probably step into discover why it's there and what it means? And so it becomes, it only becomes complicated if you're trying to track everything and figure everything out and understand everything and plan everything. If you get let go of those things and just stay present with a larger boundary of safety, then it becomes very elementally simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is what so many effective coaching approaches seem to have in common. Yes. Presence, being mm -hmm. fully present in that very moment, paying attention to what's happening right in front of you, because what's happening right in front of you, it, it, that's very often where where the solutions lie. Like yes. That's what's important is in front of you. Right. Exactly. And if you if you pay attention to that and you feed that back and you notice it and you give you and your you and your client a chance to take a look at it together, mm -hmm. um, then yeah. you know, that's that's how things emerge. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Um, where do we go next? I've completely let go of all of the questions I had noted down. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is there uh, any that stand out on your list now that still feel important to you? Yeah. So one thing I wanted to ask, uh, I mean, we don't have that much time left. We could probably talk for hours more, but uh, mm. what, I mean, that's, it's narrative, to what extent is narrative coaching still developing? I mean, there's a story around narrative coaching. I wonder what's new. Are there any trends in narrative coaching? I mean, what's, what's happening in the, in the field uh, that, that you're currently excited about or that you're currently critical about? Hmm. I'm just trying to think about things that have evolved in the program itself. Um, I, I think over the years, I've um, 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 I've 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 just observed and therefore responded by helping clients. So, like in our programs, the first third of the program is really about letting go of most of what you thought coaching was to allow yourself to be present to the moment. And so I'm just realizing more and more about, we've always stood for this, but in the world that we live in now, it's harder and harder for our coaches to do that. It's harder and harder for all of us to do that. Um, I, so I think that there's more and more discernment that we're trying to develop than before, mm -hmm. when everything was probably more matter of fact. I think the second thing that we're um, uh, exploring and doing more of is the reality that there are many types of stories and that cultures have um, cultures have different stories, genders have different stories. Um, and so to try to pay more attention to our biases about a white Western frame for coaching as a whole and narrative mm -hmm. coaching is certainly part of that. And so I think being challenged, we're having greater diversity in our programs, which I'm really loving. So people challenging some of the Western paradigms. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, another one of the things that narrative coaching has always stood for, but I think we're in the early days of trying to understand what it means now is that, uh, like I was hinting at before, so much of coaching is helping clients cope with or respond to the current realities of their life or their workplace. And for me, that's no longer good enough um, because we're just you know, doing triage. And so um, I want to understand, which, which is part of what our paper is about, um, um, how do we use coaching to create the world that we want, hmm. not just respond to the world that we have or had. 
Um, and so I think for me, um, narrative coaching is well positioned here because it's always stood for this, but I think um, part of why I'm moving away from teaching live so that more of the basics are taught asynchronously is I want to free myself to partner with pods or subsets of our community who want to take narrative coaching into some new places. Mm -hmm. So we have some people in our program now, we're not even coaches, but they want to use coaching to advance, like in a couple of cases, ecological missions. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I think it's fantastic. Because uh, I think, again, those are they're planting seeds for what coaching um, right now, so much is crammed under the umbrella of coaching. The word doesn't even mean anything anymore in some ways. Yeah. It means everything and nothing. Um, everybody's a coach now. So what, it's great. And Everybody's it's not got great. their story of what it means. Yeah. And so I think it creates an opportunity for us to develop a structure to start making, making more useful, grounded distinctions. And part of that is to free up coaching to be used more effectively to advance a collective agenda for the preservation of humanity, frankly. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and that's, I've heard you talk about that. And that's what I'm quite excited about, because I see a lot of senior practitioners start to go beyond coaching. Um, mm. Because there's an awareness that after having sent, like worked with an individual, and then they go back into an environment that hasn't changed, right. something more is needed. So I think systemic yeah. coaching has made a uh, had had a big influence of uh, mm. inviting coaches to see that maybe more is needed than coaching yeah. individuals. Um, and I also heard you talk about education, which I really resonated with, mm. is that the way that we learn is not particularly effective very often. No. And we've, since we've always learned through stories, um, how can we utilize a narrative approach to maybe as a coach with a systemic lens make more of a difference or mm. even use narrative skills or coaching skills to create more change. Where is that? Where's that change going? And in the light of, yeah. well, maybe we need to let go of the change because that's what we would do with individuals, and then things right. change. You know, I hear you have a, a desire to create some sort of change going forward. How does that? Where does yeah. it go, and how does it work together? I guess are the two questions. Yeah. So I, I have no idea where where it's going. I know what I'm at, what I'm working on, but. Um, so we have, we have a second program called the ID Way. So it's built on this body of work called integrative development. Um, and it was basically the learning and development theory that was inside narrative coaching, but we've kind of pulled it out and I've used it for years to redesign leadership programs to help uh, companies reimagine training and development work and even coaching. Um, Cause like you, like you, I, I, I'm, I got fatigue sending changed people back to unchanged environments. Hmm. Um, and so a lot of what that's providing as one of the pieces of the puzzle that you're describing is that we need a fundamentally different pedagogy or andragogy for how we think about all of this. We need to move away from a sort of a capitalistic consumerist notion of education, of inhaling um, uh, information, regurgitating information in service of somebody else's determinants of what you should know and how you should know it and what good means, et cetera. And so um, I'm, I had to, because of my health last year, I had to put it on hold, but I'll come back to next year, finishing a textbook on, on integrative development for now. But now we teach it. And one of the big uh, surprises is that about a third of the sources uh, for the book are child educators and, and uh, psychologists. Right. Because I don't think that adults learn that differently than children. Hmm. We know more, we have more capacity. We also have more limitations. Um, and I feel like um, one of the linchpins for this transformation of coaching is that we have to help coaches and our clients relearn how to learn. Otherwise, it's never going to have a systemic impact because it's all be about the transaction of the coaching conversation. And so a lot of the work that the ID is doing is taking the skills and the narrative practices of narrative coaching and being able to apply that in any moment in time. It could be a conflict with a taxi driver. It could be a, a tantrum from your child. And you having a two-year-old, you would recognize what those are about or will <laughs> soon be about. Um, how do we show up, again, as enlightened pragmatists in that moment in time? What is the story that's ramped up right now or, or 
what stories can be available to us to step into a different dimension of consciousness and approach to what's going on. And so we move, we're moving away from like with our clients, um, large curriculums, agonizing around perfect agendas, mm -hmm. fancy leadership programs to help people learn how to learn again, so that our role with them becomes very different. Um, and we're not, it, 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 the irony is that we're, we have more, we have more information 10,000 fold than previous generations. And yet I'm not sure that we're any smarter than we were before. Mm. Um, and so for me, we're trying to decelerate information and accelerate consciousness and dedication to practice. And with the amount of information that's available and is going to be available, uh, it's, I think it's what some of the things when you need most in life is the way to process and integrate that. So yeah. David, that's yeah. all we've got time for today. I wanted yes. to say um, something else wanted to come out. No, it's okay. Yeah, good. Um, good. Where can people go if they want, if that resonated with them, they wanted to learn more about any of the projects around education or learn more about narrative coaching um, where, where do they go enter your sphere? Yeah. So um, uh, we, you can find us at the moment institute.com and we're in the middle of we, next week. We'll start our, we're building out the new platform right now. We have an active community of, I don't know, maybe 400 people that we just started last year. Um, and it's just places to meet people And then we're going to slowly start introducing some of our new offers and um, kind of our new approach to developing practitioners. Um, yeah, and we have a free monthly call. We had one yesterday, um, which are amazing. And um, those are a great way to come get a taste for what we do. It's called the Beyond Coaching Experience. So we make the assumption where we need to move beyond coaching. But rather than tell you how that's going to go or where that's going to go, we just give you an experience of what that might be like. Right. Wonderful. Yeah. David, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your you work. Uh, thank you for the conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed this. And I think uh, yeah. it's, it's yeah, so meaningful that you're out there teaching people or inspiring people to yeah. uh, develop maybe a different perspective on how we yeah. learn and develop in the stories that we tell ourselves. Well, thank you, Annika. I really enjoyed it myself. Thank you. To watch these episodes on video, make sure you also check out youtube.com slash animascoaching. See you back here soon.